Good morning, Waukesha Bible Church. As we step into 2024, it brings me great joy to celebrate another year with this wonderful family. Today, on the first Sunday of the new year, we're transitioning from a season of Advent into a series of sermons that will deepen our understanding of the book of Hebrews. Throughout our journey so far in Hebrews, we've seen two main ideas. Jesus as our great high priest, and Jesus surpassing the Old Testament best. As we start this new year, we'll continue our dive into these concepts, but with a much greater perspective. In particular, we'll focus on the Old Testament Day of Atonement, or what the Jewish people would now call Yom Kippur, which will reiterate how Jesus is undoubtedly the greater high priest, the greater atoning sacrifice, and the greater mediator between God and man. During our study this morning, we'll be spending a significant part of our time in Leviticus 16, and we will be drawing parallels to show how Jesus far exceeds any Old Testament Jewish sacrificial system. We will then spend the rest of our time looking at the implications of Christ's atoning work. So as we turn to Leviticus 16, we find ourselves immersed in this rich tapestry of the Old Testament, specifically with the detailed rituals of the Day of Atonement. This chapter unfolds against the backdrop of the Israelites' journey through the wilderness and their covenant that they established with Yahweh. Here in Leviticus 16, it unveils the meticulous instructions given to the high priest for the most solemn day in the Israelite calendar, a day set aside for the purification and reconciliation of the entire community. The intricate details of this day not only offer a glimpse into God's holiness, but also foreshadow in a glorious and typological manner, the sin-bearing, sin-atoning, wrath-quenching, curse-enduring death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Before we enter our text today, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you that we get to gather and worship you. I thank you for your word and the truth of your gospel, Lord. We get to see it on display from Genesis to Revelation, the unfolding story of your story, that we get to be a part of, Lord. We thank you for this time, and I pray that this time just be edifying to you. We thank you, Lord, and it's in your name. Amen. Leviticus 16 starts right on the heels of five chapters of laws and rituals. Yet if we head back to the last true narrative text in Leviticus, found in chapter 10, it sets up the Day of Atonement very well. In Leviticus 10, we find the, the death of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu. We see that God had spoken in his word the proper way to approach him, yet Nadab and Abihu got it so wrong that God roasted them. Here in Leviticus 10, the consequences of unauthorized worship serve as a cautionary tale, reinforcing their strict, obe their strict need for obedience to God's laws for entering his presence. Thankfully in shadow, Leviticus 16 provides a temporary solution to the problem of sinful man entering the presence of a holy God. And this was done through the rituals of the Day of Atonement. Ultimately, this is man's biggest problem. Ever since the fall, our sin has separated us from God's unadulterated presence and glory. What Adam and Eve once had in the garden, their disobedience then severed. Not only were they banished from God's presence, but so also was mankind as a whole. The rebellion marked an onset of the fallen nature of mankind and disrupted the once perfect communion with God and embedded sin into the very fabric of human existence. Because of the holiness of our God, his presence cannot coexist with sin, leading to the inevitable consequence of separation from God's presence. We see this vividly displayed with Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden. The perfect harmony that once existed between God and man now needed reconciliation. So likening this back to Leviticus 16, we see that ever since the fall, no man can enter the presence of our holy God on their own merit. Therefore, in shadow form, the old covenant law laid out a pathway for Israel's high priest to approach the holy presence of God without facing the dire consequences experienced in Adam and Eve's expulsion or in the roasting of Nadab and Abihu. Leviticus 16 begins with three verses, circling back and connecting us to the death of Aaron's sons. Verses 1 through 3 read, 
The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. When they drew near before the Lord and died, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. But in this way Aaron shall, not, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Here we see that God explicitly warns Aaron not to enter the holy place at just any time except on the Day of Atonement, where he must follow specific rituals to avoid facing the same fate as his sons. Beginning in verse 3 and spanning all the way to the end of the chapter, we see these detailed requirements set out for the high priest. As a representative for the nation of Israel, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle or the tent of meeting for the atonement process. So what exactly is included in this process? I mean, God only demands perfection, so I'm sure that this atonement process couldn't have been that strict or that hard. Step one for the high priest was to bathe himself and put on holy linen garments. The priest needed to be clothed in righteousness before he could come to present a sacrifice to atone for his own sins, as he himself was sinful and unclean. Throughout Leviticus 16, we see this constant need for representation. Even the high priest could not enter into the presence of God on his own merit. He and his garments needed to be cleansed. He also needed a sin offering for himself, ensuring his own personal purification. As we see here in verses 7 through 10, following the priest's self-purification, two goats are now brought into the fold, and lots were cast over them. One was to be sacrificed to the Lord as a sin offering, and the other, the goat for Azazel, was to be sent alive into the wilderness. As we look at verses 11 and following, we see that this process begins to be laid out. After Aaron offers a bull as a sin offering for himself, we see that the sacrificial goat is first on the chopping block. This was the goat given to the Lord as a sin offering for the people. After slaughtering the goat, the high priest put his hands on the head of the animal and confessed the sins of the people, transferring the sins of the people to the substitutionary victim. Instead of the people facing the full consequences of the sin, the goat bears the penalty for the people. The high priest would then put the blood in a bowl from the sacrifice and take it into the Holy of Holies through the veil. He used it to cleanse the most holy place and the altar. Here in the sacrifice, we see the idea of propitiation on display. The sacrifice of the Lord's goat is intended to propitiate or appease God's justice and stop his righteous wrath against sin. So we see in the Lord's atonement, sacrificial, substitutionary goat, it shows a shadow where the life of the innocent atones for the life of the guilty. The second goat, the scapegoat, the one for Azazel, has, been, has a slightly different fate. After atonement was made with the first goat and sacrifice to the Lord, the high priest then worked with the scapegoat. Starting in verse 20, we see this start to be unpacked. And when he had made an end of the atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat, and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel, and all their transgression, all their sin. And he shall put them on the head of the goat, and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Here we see that the high priest laid his hands on the head of the goat, symbolizing the transfer or the imputation of sins, of the sins of the people to the goat. And the goat was driven out into the wilderness outside of the presence of God's blessing, and it bore the sins of the people and carried it far away. Here with the sending out of the scapegoat, we see the idea of expiation being played out. Simply put, Expiation is the process of removing or cleansing one from sin. This is the same idea the psalmist gets at in Psalm 103, verse 12, where he says, For as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. 
Summarized in one sentence, when the scapegoat is sent out into oblivion, the sins of the people are scapegoated. From verse 23 through 28, we then see that God is essentially confirming that he has accepted the sacrifices and offerings made by the high priest. After Aaron cleanses himself and changes his garments, he goes to the outer tabernacle, where he uses the blood of the bulls and goats to cleanse the altar and make atonement for it. This burning and cleansing was done to ensure that the Lord had accepted the sin offerings made by the high priest. The last section of Leviticus that we heard read today will focus on verses 29 and 30 through 34, which is what I like to call Atonement's Annual Encore. We see that for the Israelites, the ceremonies of the Day of Atonement are not strictly for a one-time event. They are to be an annual observance. For Israel, the Day of Atonement meant a solemn day of rest, abstaining from work and intensely focusing on just the one event going on, which was atonement. Keep in mind that throughout the year, the sins of the Israelites are being stored up against them. This undoubtedly would have sparked a fear in them of being cast out of God's presence and facing his judgment. In modern terms, they would have questioned if they were, being, if they were saved. However, amidst the rituals of blood sprinkling and sacrifices, they found confidence that for another year, they were safe. In contrast, we possess a much greater assurance through a superior promise. Through Christ's sacrifice, we are secure. Instead of having to re-up every year like the Israelites needed to, we know our salvation is secured by a blood of a much greater sacrifice, and we rest perfectly secure in him. So having gone through the events of the Day of Atonement found in Leviticus 16, let's now look at some key implications to come out of this idea. The first idea that we'll look at is the insufficiency of man to enter into the presence of God. We don't have to look very far into other scriptures to see this truth on display. The Day of Atonement and the role of the high priest puts this idea front and center. Because of God's character, because he is both holy and just, Sinful man cannot survive in the unfiltered presence of God. In the case of the high priest's atonement, we see that only once a year could a man ever enter into his presence. And even that was through countless cleansings, rituals, and offerings. This ritual is so sacred and so precise that some even believe the high priest would have a rope tied around his ankle in case he burned up in God's presence and they had to remove his body. God's glory is clearly not something for a man to temper with. Yet even here in Leviticus 16 with the high priest, once he did offer them, in, once he did enter into the most holy place, he still had to have incense burning to cover himself from the Shekinah glory of God's dwelling. For one man to enter God's presence took the blood of multiple animals in direct obedience to the rituals laid out. So we see even this presence is filtered. God's presence was not something that sinful man could enter into on his own. And we saw that clearly displayed with Nadab and, Ab and Abihu in Leviticus 10 when they were struck down by God. And while we briefly touched on this at the beginning of the sermon, we see, that we see this idea most pointedly in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. After Adam and Eve sinned and God promised to provide a seed from the woman, he then covered Adam and Eve with new skins. Here in Genesis 3:21, we see what we refer to as the blood picture. God uses the skins of an innocent animal to cover man's shame and guilt and provide protection for them. Yet even that protection was insufficient as God banished them from the garden and removed Adam and Eve from the perfect fellowship that they once had. God's holiness always demands sinless perfection. What Adam and Eve once had in the garden their, dis their disobedience then severed. Not only were they banished from God's presence, but subsequently all of mankind was banished from his presence as well. The problem still lies that our sin deserves God's wrath. And is this wrath in which Adam and Eve needed protection? In clothing Adam and Eve, the Lord shows us that he will meet the need ultimately through a substitutionary sacrifice of Christ Jesus. God shows us in shadow that the righteousness of another will come to cover the sins of the people. Through the blood of Christ, 
Believers will now be able to run into the throne room, marked by grace with confidence before the Father. Left to our own merits, we'd find ourselves like Nadab and Abihu, struck down by God's unfiltered glory. Yet in God's grace and his mercy, we have a great high priest who enters in and mediates on our behalf. Not only does he perform the sacrifice for his people, but he is the sacrifice for his people. He is simultaneously the great high priest and the atoning sacrifice. Christ is the one who bears the shame, wears the guilt, removes the weight, spans the gap, pays the debt on our behalf. In Christ's penal substitution, the veil is torn from top to bottom, and we as his people are now invited into his holy presence. Understanding that on our own accord, we are totally unable to bridge this gap between sinful man and a holy God. It then becomes imperative that we understand the transformative nature of Christ's atonement. I'm not sure of a text in all of Scripture that is as rich as the six verses found near the end of Romans 3. If you would please flip to Romans 3, 21 through 26 as we read. Romans 3, 21 through 26 is as follows. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans 3 is a text that brings me immense clarity about the depravity of man, the holiness of God, and the substitutionary nature of Christ's atonement. Here in Romans 3, 23, we are given our condition. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then we are immediately following in verse 24, we are given our solution. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So what does this mean? How does this relate to atonement? Well, here Paul lays out man's need for a substitute. As he has already dropped the hammer for the first two chapters of Romans, laying out man's fallen nature. And now he gives us a clear statement that we have all fallen short of God's standard. We need an individual to atone in our place because we are in violation of God's righteous standard. Yet God's standard is so high that only God could ever reach it. But his standard is also so specific that it requires an individual to obtain it. See the dilemma? How could a fallen man obtain the standard of perfection? We know that the writer of Hebrews tells us that the blood of bulls and goats could never pay this penalty. So who could? Well, former pastor and reform rapper Shai Lin answers this question better than I ever could. Addressing this problem, he writes, Can you truly f understand fallen man's dilemma? See, only a human could substitute for human lives, but only God can take the wrath of God and survive. See this humanly unsolvable obstacle? With God, all is plausible. Nothing's impossible. You missed that. My very fast rapping. The lyric goes, Only a human can substitute for human lives, but only God can take the wrath of God and survive. The answer to our problem is found in the hypostatic union. The God-man, the one who is fully God and fully man, is our only possible substitute who can sim simultaneously take on the fullness of God's wrath and represent man in doing so. In Genesis 3, we saw that humanity failed to be God's regents, yet what we couldn't do, Jesus did, and he did it as one of us. Once again, we must realize our big problem, the wrath of God against sinful man. But thankfully, 
we have a greater sacrifice who in love made the great exchange on our behalf. In a deal that would cause many general managers to cringe, Jesus on the cross exchanged his glory and righteousness and traded it for our depravity. In what is called the great exchange on the cross, Jesus exchanged his righteousness for our sinfulness. He took our place so that we could take his. In Christ's death, we see this idea of double imputation. At Calvary, the sins of the believers were given or imputed to Jesus, so that in condemning Jesus, God condemned our sins in Christ, bearing us from the full brunt of the Father's wrath. In turn, Christ's righteousness is imputed or given to us through faith, so that we can be declared righteous and acceptable in God's sight. If we lose this idea of Christ being our penal substitute, we are in grave danger of losing the core essence of the gospel. Christ's death is substitutionary in that, it, in that one takes our place. It is penal in that it answers the penalty of those living in violation of God's law. And it is an atonement in that it covers the guilt of the transgressor. The one who is righteous shall take the place of another who is guilty. He who is innocent dies for the peace of the criminal. The righteous one is treated like a leper in order to cleanse the defiled and the unholy. In Christ's atoning work on Calvary's cross, God's wrath is quenched, man's sin is scapegoated, and Christ's righteousness is gifted. And to that we can say, Amen. Sadly, in many theologically liberal circles, some will try to argue against the idea of Christ taking on the fullness of God's wrath, and they'll label it cosmic child abuse. And they'd be right. It would be a terrible miscarriage of justice to punish an innocent man in the place of a sinner. It would be unjust if the substitute were unwilling. Yet Christ's death was a willing sacrifice. He voluntarily laid down his life for his people. I want us all now to flip to John 10. Here we will see a familiar passage about Jesus being our good shepherd. Focusing specifically on verses 14 through 18, we read, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. This is the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Here we begin to explore the willingness of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. We saw back in Leviticus 16, as the Day of Atonement unfolds, marked by rituals of blood and sacrifice, there's a solemn plea for reconciliation with God. We now fast forward to John 10, and we encounter Jesus as our good shepherd, voluntarily laying down his life for the sheep. The parallel is striking. Just as the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies with sacrificial blood to atone for sins, Jesus willingly enters the world, humbled himself by taking on flesh, and offered himself as a substitute on our behalf. The nature of Christ's death cannot be mistaken. His death was voluntary, and it most certainly was penal in nature. John 10, verses 17 through 18 makes it abundantly clear that Christ voluntarily died for his people. No one could take his life from him. His death was inexplicably voluntary. He is most certainly a willing savior. Reminds me of when I first became a Christian. I was listening to a sermon on John 10 and I heard an example of a speeding ticket to explain Christ's willing sacrifice. And I'll read it here in the first person. For instance, if I got a ticket for speeding and I went to court, I couldn't argue my way out of it, the facts were in, and I was guilty. 
I said, Your Honor, I don't have enough money to pay the fine. The judge says, Oh, okay. He goes to the bailiff and says, Hey, go on the street and find the first guy you see and bring him on in. So the bailiff does as he's told, and he brings the next guy in. The judge says, You're paying this man's fine. That would not be just. Or let's just say a friend is there and they volunteer and they say, Your Honor, I'm a wealthy and gracious man. I want to pay the fine for my friend. Would the court be satisfied by this? Of course. As long as the debt is paid, the judge would be satisfied. But even this illustration does not carry it far enough. Because in our case, it's not just a friend or a bystander who pays our debt. It is the judge himself. The one who is just becomes the justifier, steps down and pays the fine on our behalf. This illustration, while overly simplistic, gives us an incredible picture of this exchange. We have to realize in this teaching that we cannot look at Jesus' death as something that we ultimately deserve. What Jesus is emphasizing here in John 10, at least by implication, is that he did not come as one who was obliged to come. Jesus did not need to come. Yet when we were yet sinners, Christ came and humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. The whole motive behind his sacrifice is not found in anything in us. It's found only in him. This is precisely what makes him the good shepherd, that he willingly lays down his life for his sheep. It's one thing to say that Jesus did this for us when we didn't deserve it, but the whole truth is not told until we go on and say what we did deserve was condemnation at his very own hands. When we realize that the one who bore the penalty of our sins is the very one whom we've transgressed, he's the very one who held the authority to condemn us rightfully. But in his divine grace, in his mercy, Christ willingly becomes both just and the justifier for an undeserving people. But we also must understand that Christ's willingness is not contrary to the Father's sending of Christ. This mission was laid out before the foundation of the earth. The plan was defined by the Father, and the Son willingly took it. He received this command from his Father, and so he willingly laid down his life. We see that the Son came to do the Father's will, not by force, but in an act of incredible and willing submission to the Father. Christ, seeing us in danger of God's divine judgment and wrath that we rightly deserved, came running to our rescue. No concern for himself, no concern for the cost, but in love, he willingly laid down his life in our place. So far we've looked at the historical context of atonement, the insufficiency of man to enter God's presence, the nature of Christ's atonement, the willingness of our Savior, and we will now focus on the security we can find in Christ's work. Specifically here, we will focus on how the once-for-all-time nature of Christ's atonement far exceeds the repetitive nature of the Old Covenant Day of Atonement. In order to fully grasp the matter of atonement, it must be done in comparing the old versus the new. The idea of Christ being a once-for-all-time sacrifice found all throughout the book of Hebrews, but specifically here in chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. The text reads, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered, for all time, a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. When looking at the sacrifice of Christ, the language is quite clear and quite astounding, especially considering what the Jewish people would have known about atonement. Yearly sacrifices were a, light, a way of life for them. That is all that they knew for hundreds of years. Yet Christ's singular atoning death changed everything. This idea of once for all, or once for all time, simply means that something happened that was decisive. The act accomplished something that never needed to be repeated again. An effort to repeat this would discredit the achievement that happened once for all. When we look at the Old Testament, it's a repetitive cycle. It truly was a gloomy reality that year 
after year, after year, after year, after year, the priests in Israel had to offer animal sacrifices for their own sins and the sins of the people. These offerings only veiled the sins. They never fully paid for them. Every aspect of this sacrificial system proved to be temporary and ultimately insufficient. Yet amidst this impermanence, there was yet a glimmer of hope. And that hope was Christ. If God deemed these imperfect practices worthy of acceptance, it certainly meant that one day he would send a qualified, capable servant of accomplishing what the priest could not achieve, which was to put away sin once and for all. In his death and resurrection, Christ is all of this for us. He is our final high priest and our final sacrifice. He has fulfilled all that the law and the systems required. He is the greater sacrifice, and there will never be a need for another. In Christ's atonement on Calvary's cross, he was not just another sacrifice. He was the sacrifice who secured our salvation. Christ's once-for-all-time sacrifice accomplished the saving mission for which he came into this world. Matthew 1, 21 makes clear that Christ did not just come to make salvation possible. Christ came specifically to secure the salvation of his people. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12 also speaks of how Christ has secured the redemption of his people through his blood. And that text reads, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of bulls and goats, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. We are further assured that not a single drop of Christ's blood was shed in vain. We can have complete assurance that Christ alone is the one who keeps us, and his very own blood attests to this. Through Christ's blood, God justifies the believer. If this is not based on the worthiness of their belief, but on the worthiness of who they believed. It's not about the amount of their faith, but it's solely on the object of their faith. The assurance is found in our Savior, not in us. The work is all his. The redemption price has already been paid, and everyone whom he will save has already been purchased. In doing this, Christ truly saved all for whom he died. We never need to worry if we are saved or if we're falling out of fellowship. Because in the meaning of it, this is the meaning of it is finished. He's accomplished everything and it's complete in Christ. In his atonement, he paid the price once for all time and has secured the salvation for his people. By this one-way love, we have the sole basis of our assurance and the foundation of our hope. And the hope is this, that Christ, as our great high priest and as our atoning sacrifice, has laid down his life, taken on the fullness of God's wrath against sin, exchanged his righteousness for our sinfulness, and has completely satisfied all that God requires on our behalf. The last point, which will be our shortest, is focused on the priesthood of the believer. This idea is centered around our direct access to God and our identity as God's people. No text lays out the identity in Christ and our status as his people better than 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. The text reads, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This identity as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for his very own possession was previously given to the nation of Israel. But in Christ, these realities became our realities. We are now God's chosen people. There's no longer any distinction between Jew or Gentile, male or female, Slave or free, there is now one people of God, and it is those who are in union with him through faith in Christ. 
In the Old Covenant setting, the Jews were God's chosen people. They received the God's oracles, they received his law, they had the benefits of God's blessings that the Gentiles did not. The priesthood came out of Israel. The Mosaic Covenant came out of Israel. The high priests, the sacrifices, the atonement were all strictly for the people of Israel. Yet under this new covenant, Gentiles have been grafted in. There's no longer any advantage in being a Jew as Jews and Gentiles alike have the same privilege through Christ's finished work. All who believe are now part of the singular people of God. Nothing lays out this shift in privilege better than when we look at atonement in the temple. When we look at Leviticus 16 in the Old Testament, we know that inside the Holy of Holies is where the presence of God dwelt. And nobody goes there except the high priest. And that only once a year. And then outside of that, there's a place where the priest would minister. And there's an area where the Levites can go. And the Jewish men can go. And the Jewish women can go. And then way out here is the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles still come to know and love Yahweh. And they worship him. And when they do, they're still way far off. As far from the presence of Yahweh as they could possibly get. But Christ dies. And the veil of the temple is torn in two. Now all of a sudden, in Christ, you who have to, used to have to sit way, way, way far back, away from the presence of Yahweh, have been brought near. We know that the blood of bulls and goats and the shadow of the things to come could never make perfect those who drew near. But in Christ, we no longer look to shadows or types. Instead, we draw near to God himself by the blood of the perfect sacrifice. In this radical transformation brought about by Christ's death, we may now draw near to him. With the tearing of the temple veil, the repetition is over. The old covenant is no more. And those of us who were once distant from the presence of God are brought close. By his blood, all those who are in Christ are now welcome to draw near to God and find our soul rest in his finished work. Let us pray. Dear Father, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for the truths found in Leviticus 16 and throughout all the Bible, Lord. We thank you for what was once shadow has now become substance, and we find our soul rest in this greater fulfillment. Lord, you are so good and you are so worthy. We praise you today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.